While Patsy was on this search, Chick had been following Lanigan, whose movements about the city seemed to be marked by neither purpose nor intention. Nevertheless, Chick kept close at his heels. Nick had found Ida, and from her had learned that she had another talk with Mrs. Pemberton and had convinced her that Elwell, the lawyer, whom she had trusted so much, was playing her false. The principal thing to bring her into that frame of mind was the belief that he had taken the $10,000 check which Mr. Heron had given her from the drawings and the models of her husband with the intention of cheating her out of it. She was now quite certain that she had done wrong and was willing to carry out the intentions of her husband and deal with Mr. Heron as the unsigned articles of agreement provided. Nick had sought Ida with a view of preparing her for the visit of Spike the next morning. He had intended to let Ida arrange with Mrs. Pemberton for this and meant that Ida should, as Mrs. Pemberton, receive Spike. That was in accordance with the job Patsy had put up and finding that Mrs. Pemberton had changed her position entirely in regard to Mr. Heron, he proposed to Ida that he should go with her to Mrs. Pemberton at once and tell her all that had occurred during the day, and thus show to her the kind of people into whose hands she had fallen. This was done, and Mrs. Pemberton, under the showing of Nick, saw clearly that her only hope of receiving any profit from her late husband's work was first in the recovery of the papers of Mr. Heron, and secondly, through Mr. Heron. Becoming convinced of this, she was not only willing, but eager to assist in carrying out the plans which Patsy had formed and which had been approved and adopted by Nick. So it was arranged that when Spike called, Ida, made up for and pretending to be Mrs. Pemberton, should receive and dicker with Spike. That there should be no hitch in this program, Ida remained in Mrs. Pemberton's house overnight. It was Nick's purpose to be in the house also in the morning, so that if, as a consequence of those negotiations, Spike brought the drawings, he could seize them. The matter thus being arranged, Nick returned to his home. The next morning, before Patsy was fairly dressed, Spike Thomas, followed by Bolly Morris, burst into his room in a state of wild excitement and rage. A glance of Patsy's was sufficient to assure him that both Spike and Bolly were more than half drunk. They were so excited that for a moment neither could speak, but stood gasping in an effort. Finally, Spike blurted out, We've been robbed! Patsy turned sharply on him and said, Not of the drawings and models. Yes, the same! Patsy's disappointment was great. But checking himself, he said with forced calmness, Tell me all about it. It was not so easy for the two crooks, and they begun such a mixture of oaths, assertions, and contradictions of each other that Patsy was forced to stop them, and telling Morris to be quiet and not say a word, instructed Spike to tell the tale. Under his statement, it appeared that, being afraid of Lanigan, they had kept away all night, not alone from their usual haunts, but from their homes. They had spent the night in obscure, and to them, strange places drinking. When daylight had come, and they had thought it safe to venture into the part of the city where they lived, they had gone to Spike's rooms to get the drawings and models here hidden away, with the intention of carrying them to a place where they could easily get them if the bargaining with Mrs. Pemberton turned out as Patsy had assured them it would. But on reaching that room, the drawings and models were not in the place where they had been deposited. They had made a most exhaustive search of the room without a discovery or trace of them, and having roused up everybody in the house, had pushed their inquiries without receiving any information as to the disappearance of the drawings. But they had learned that one of the tenants in the house, at a late hour in the previous night, had seen two men enter Spike Thomas's rooms, supposing one of them to be Spike Thomas. 
As neither Spike Thomas nor Bolly Morris had been near the rooms during the night, the conclusion was that somebody had entered for the purpose of stealing those drawings and models and had obtained them. That was the whole story, although it was garnished with oaths and guesses and charges. Patsy at once formed an idea as to who those thieves were, but he made no remark to Bolly Morris or Spike. Sending them away, with instructions to hold themselves in readiness to obey any call that he might make on them, he hurriedly finished his dressing and went to the room of Chick, who had quarters in the same house. Rapping on Chick's door, he received, however, no response. The door was locked, and as Chick was a light sleeper, Patsy felt that Chick was not within his room. In his own room, there was a key to Chick's, as there was in Chick's a key to his, that each might enter the other's room when necessity required. Obtaining that key and entering the room, Patsy saw at a glance that Chick had not occupied it during the night. Holy smoke, he said to himself aloud. I don't like the looks of this. I must tell the chief. Dashing downstairs into the street, Patsy went to a drugstore where there was a telephone that he frequently used and obtained communication with Nick at his home. Telling his chief what had occurred, the third theft of the papers, he also said that Chick had not returned to his room during the night. Chief! said Patsy over the wire. I'm going to try and pick up track of Chick. Where? asked Nick. I shall strike Rivington and the Bowery first, then 34th Street, and then 42nd Street. Right, replied Nick. Who does Spike think were the thieves? asked Nick. He thinks they are two young toughs who live in the same house, and who saw them stowing away these things. I think that's the straight road to the papers. The two now hurried up the Bowery to its end to pick up the trail Chick had left behind him. Arriving at the last mark Patsy had observed, they soon discovered that the next one led them up Third Avenue, and following them, which grew plainer as they proceeded, they were carried to 34th Street, where the marks indicated that Chick had passed to the east. But as they turned to go down that street, Patsy dashed across the street to look at something tied to the rail of the steps leading to the elevated railroad station. It was a string of yellow cloth. Carefully examining the pavement, he ran up and down a short distance like a dog getting the scent and then, stepping to the curbstone, vigorously beckoned to Nick to come to him. Chick has been going down 34th Street, he said, and back again to go up 3rd Avenue. A sign on the elevated railroad station gives us the tip. That carriage has been out nearly all night? Well, is it any business of yours? replied the stableman in a surly tone. Answer my question, sternly demanded Nick. Didn't know you asked the question, replied the man. Has that carriage been out overnight? asked Nick in a calm, icy voice. What for? Because I tell you, I'm Nick Carter. What did they look like? Hard to tell. They changed their looks two or three times. Where'd they go? One man came here first and hired the coach, said the man. And he was a black-haired, black-eyed man. Then he drove up to 42nd Street and Avenue A, where he took in another man. Then they drove down to the Bowery and into 4th Street, where they left the coach and told me to wait for them. They staked me to wait until they came back. It was near daylight when the second one came to me and, getting in the coach, went down to the corner of Rivington Street. Were you followed by anybody? Yes, replied the man with a look of surprise. Did the men you were riding know it? No, replied the man. A fellow came out of the other coach when I was in 4th Street and told me he'd break my head if I let the other fellows know that he was following. And he meant it, too. Chick tied that cloth on the axle in a chance that we might run up against it during the night. No doubt of that, said Patsy. 
to 23rd Street and 4th Avenue, replied Nick. Chick has been on the track of these people, whoever they are, and it's dollars to cents that when they left their coach at 23rd Street, he left his in pursuit. Nick and Patsy hurried to the point indicated, and as Nick had foreseen, they found on the corner one of the red chalk marks that gave them the direction. The signs were fresh, easily seen, showing that they had been made within a recent time. Here's the trail. Little pieces of this yellow cloth. Chick was on the sneak here and not in the open. Hurriedly, they followed this new trail, and it led them to the middle of the block on which was the house in which Patsy had his row, as he called it. Indeed, when they came to a stop, they were almost opposite the door of that house. Here, carefully placed against the bottom of a lamppost, was a ball of yellow cloth about the size of a baseball. The end of the trail, said Patsy. And Chick is somewhere about, added Nick. I'll give a signal that Chick will know if he's here, said Patsy. Hide yourself. Nick went into a neighboring doorway, and Patsy, slipping into the street, got between two covered wagons that stood there, backed up to the curb, without horses in front of them. Suddenly, there sounded on the air the sharp, yelping bark of a frightened dog, ending in a prolonged howl. Patsy slipped back to the pavement and to the cover of some boxes that were piled nearby. The two waited but a moment, when Chick came down the street, looking in every direction. Nick gave a low signal, and Chick darted into the hallway where Nick was, Patsy quickly joining him. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, share, and subscribe to the channel to see the latest videos. Thank you.